Let's shift our attention now to the umbrella body of lawyers here in Nigeria. The Nigeria Bar Association, Olumide Akpata, a senior partner and head of the corporate and commercial practice group, the Templars Law Firm, joins us now. Mr. Akpata is aspiring to be the next president of the Nigeria Bar Association here in Nigeria. Um, it's good to have you, Mr. Akpata. A lot of, P a lot of expectations will be on the neck of the Nigeria Bar Association over the coming, over the next few days. Uh, let me now start it off from a popular question. Lawyers, who are part of the Nigeria Bar Association, usually ask, what does the Bar Association do for lawyers except collect levies and remunerations without giving anything back to the lawyers? And what would you try to do that would be a little bit different from what others have been doing in time past? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I must say very quickly that, yes, I am one of the candidates cleared to run for the office of the president of the Nigeria Bar Association come our elections in uh, July, uh, the 29th and the 30th of July. Um, but what I must make clear to you is that um, there is a ban on campaigning. So as such, um, I, I really... I'm unable to begin to lay out for you what my plans, my programs, and my policies will be for the association in the event that I become elected. So, uh, but if in general terms I can answer your question, which is what does the bar do for lawyers? And the bar, I think, uh, in today's context, for lawyers, firstly, is, is, is meant to um, provide platforms where, whereby our members, lawyers in Nigeria, can practice their profession um, proficiently, sustainably, and in a profitable manner. That is really what the bar is set up to do. The association should be doing. The association should be enabling the practice of law in Nigeria. The association should be uh, improving on the welfare and conditions of uh, its members, the lawyers in Nigeria. The association should be providing um, avenues for knowledge development and capacity building because, as you know, we are knowledge merchants. What we sell is knowledge, and the pipeline, the pipeline of knowledge must continue to flow unimpeded. So it is matters of this nature that the bar, the association, should be involved in. And there's also the issues concerning the protection of um, human rights, the defense of human rights, the defense of the rule of law. That is actually a, a major com a critical component of our raison d'etre, which is why we actually exist, the protection of the rule of law and the human rights of the citizens. Indeed, as an association, we find that our members are at the front line of, uh, of, of this battle. Our members actually bear the brunt of the struggle. You find that lawyers are harassed on a daily basis uh, by the police, by the security agents, and it is the responsibility of the association to protect lawyers who are harassed, intimidated in the course of carrying out their uh, duties as lawyers. And, um, and, and the MBA must be up and doing in this regard. Okay. Uh, and just to flip that, uh, you talk about rule of law, and I'm very excited about that. I like talking about the disciplinary uh, process of legal practitioners in Nigeria, which the Nigerian Bar Association also uh, takes care of. Because more and more, we see constant erosion of confidence in the way lawyers who are serving in the executive arm of government, either at the federal level or the state level, uh, carry out their duties inimical to what they really should be doing. Uh, for instance, the rule of law. You see attorney generals who advise or who, uh, you know, sort of encourage the executive arm of government to disobey court orders. What will be different? Would anything be different this time around? I, I know you have said the campaigns, there are bans of, on campaign, but what do you have to say about this? Well, well, you're very correct, and you touch on a very, very important point. Uh, we're a self-regulating organization, and so, and that is a very huge responsibility. Um, to whom much is given, much is expected, and we cannot, as an association, pay lip service to the issue of the 
discipline or the disciplining of our, uh, of our members. Because as you have said, the, the, where we do not carry this function, carry out this function effectively, there's an erosion of confidence as far as members of the public are concerned. So um, right now we do have the Legal Practitioners Disciplinary Committee. It is operational, but to my mind, I think um, there's a lot more needs to be done to ensure that there is enough, that it is properly resourced, a lot more needs to be done to be sure that it is optimally uh, carrying out its responsibilities. Um, I think the structure of the LPDC as we have it may have been good for times past, but in today's world, with so much going on, uh, and so much activity going on in our, in our space, we must restructure, we must restructure the way and manner in which we discipline our colleagues. Um, there must be accountability, there must be sanctions, and we cannot be shy or timid about applying the sanctions. So I think the MBA must be ready to name and shame, call out its members who are, uh, who are derelict or who, who are badly behaved. And, um, I, and that is it's actually a no-brainer for me as an individual. We, we must be able to do that. Now, we, with all of the best intentions, you may not be able to do that if you don't put the proper infrastructure in place. There must be a system, a well-resourced system, that allows for us to effectively and timelessly deal with the petitions that come up against our colleagues. Because justice must not only be seen to be done, it must be seen to have been effectively done. So I think um, that really is what I, um, the extra that will need to be done just to make sure that we are not paying lip service to the process. We are actually resourcing the LPDC, ensuring that it has panels all over the country that are ready to run, ensuring that it has a proper secretariat, ensuring that we have members on the panels that are fit and proper and able to carry out the, the role of that committee. All right, Mr. Akbata, a lot of people might say and that the Nigeria Bar Association has, is losing ease, verve, and influence over time, maybe because uh, some have attributed it to the fact that this money for votes in electing or in electing a president might have actually been responsible for this. Do you think at this moment the Nigeria Bar Association is not as revered as it once was? Well, let me, let me quickly put on record or state that I, when you say money for votes, um, that I must very quickly counter. Um, that does not exist. I don't know that that exists, and I hope you're not referring to the Nigeria Bar Association. Now, um, have, we, have we lost our revert status? I would think so. There's, a, there's been a watering down. Uh, as with many institutions in this country, um, what obtained previously is not what obtains today. And I think a lot has to be done. Uh, we really need to reappraise uh, the, role, uh, the role we play in society. Firstly, we must look again at our responsibility to our members so that we can, we can uh, as salt, we can regain our taste. Um, our members look up to us for, uh, for protection, for, for, like I said previously, creating and enabling the environment for them to practice effectively their profession. They, they need to see the value that the association adds to their professional lives. But the rest of society looks up, up, looks up to us also. The rest of society, we are the voice to the, those who are ordinarily voiceless. Um, protecting the rule of law is, is almost a divine responsibility and mandate. But we seem to have been distracted by other issues. We seem to have deprioritized some of these responsibilities for which society has looked up to us in the past. So I think a reprioritization of our objectives and our, uh, um, the role, or should I say the, the, the things that we think are important, we need to bring them back to the front burner. And that I think will help the MBA uh, regain its verve, as you say, uh, and, um, and, and you know, um, make the public and its members fall in love with the association again. That is not to say that the MBA is not uh, doing, uh, playing its role uh, at the moment. The MBA is doing, I think, as much as it can in the circumstances. There's a lot of internal rejigging that needs to be done um, for it to be able to do better. And that is what I think is missing 
we will need to look inwards, restructure, and then reorganize so that we can play the role that society expects us to play. Okay, Mr. Pasa, let's step away from the NBA for a moment. Uh, as one aspiring to become the next president of the Nigerian Bar Association, I'd like to get your thought on latest development, uh, the rift uh, between the National Assembly and the Minister of State for Labour. Uh, it was quite the embarrassing scene we all saw on national and international TV like ours. Um, that has led to the suspension of that recruitment program by Mr. President for 774,000 young Nigerians. Uh, it has raised a lot of questions around separation of powers, the rule of law. Who, in your own opinion, as a professional, as a lawyer, who has erred on the side of the law here? The lawmakers or the Minister of Labor for state? Well, as you know, as you know uh, I'm a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I must have the facts before I, I delve into any matter. Um, I must confess that all I know of this matter is um, what I saw on television uh, when my friend, and, uh, my friend and my colleague, Leonard Senior Advocate uh, Festus Keyamo, the Minister of State for Labour, was appearing before, I believe, a select committee of the, uh, of the House of Representatives. The Joint Committee. Yeah, the Joint Committee, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, what I heard from, I mean, all that transpired, um, the part of it that I caught was uh, Lilena Silkayamo insisting on um, whatever, the, uh, whatever would ha was going to happen at that hearing for it to be made public and not in camera, as the members of the committee had requested. Um, I saw that it was uh, quite a heated exchange. Um, and I saw uh, Mr. Kayamo insisting that um, he would rather be, uh, he would rather uh, make, uh, give his, um, give his uh, testimony at the hearing um, in, in front of the cameras, not in camera, as it were. Um, who is right, who is wrong? I would need to study the facts before I come to that uh, conclusion. But I must say here that I am all for transparency. I am all for um, everything being done in the open, the business of government being done in the open. And I am all for, I, I'm all for uh, getting rid of the opaque um, ways and means in which we carry out uh, the business of government in this country. So if that is the only part I heard of that conversation, I'm all for it. There's no reason why anything should be hidden. If the minister okay. wanted, to be, uh, in, seen, uh, wanted to be in the full glare, of the public, that seemed to me to be a reasonable request. And not to hold brief for the National Assemblies or the members of the Joint Committee, but doesn't the Constitution allow them to dictate how their session uh, should be carried out? And they say uh, the Minister has no rights to say how the executive session should hold. If they wanted to go into uh, a closed door session, the Constitution allows them to do so. Well, you know, like I said, we have. To they are well within their rights to conduct their affairs in the way and manner that they deem fit or the law permits. But like I said, all I can mention is that transparency is for me, uh, is for me critical. And it would appear that the minister was quite concerned about uh, uh, him being asked to uh, meet with them in camera. Um, you know, you and I don't know what could have transpired before that. Um, I always call for the presumption of regularity on both sides. I want to believe they are reasonable people. If the Leonard Professor Kayamo was minded to request for this uh, open, open uh, session, I'm sure that there must have been reasons for it. Uh, I know him very well, so I, I would like to believe that uh, there would have been reasons for that insistence. And, then, like, and the members of the House of Representatives too, uh, the members of that joint committee, they must have had their own reasons. But I am very hesitant to go into the uh, merits of, the, of that particular exchange. I was only pointing out that the bit that I heard about an individual wanting to be heard in public, um, that, that resonated with me. All right, uh, Mr. Akbata, um, would you like, I would like to find out, uh, get your opinion about 
um, the federal government and the rule of law, which has always been an issue since 2015 till date. The Nigeria Bar Association was quoted as saying in 2019 that the federal government have often assaulted and lay prostrate the rule of law. How would you assess how the rule of law has been upheld under this dispensation of government? Well, in my view, I think um, um, there has been a, a reasonable attempt to uphold the rule of law by this government. And I say so because um, we have as our vice president, a senior advocate of Nigeria, and we have also our attorney general and quite a number of senior members of the bar, uh, uh, members of this government. Having said that, I was very concerned when the president of the republic uh, uh, spoke at our conference a couple of years ago, and he mentioned to the association, he stated in clear terms, that the rule of law in Nigeria would have to, will, there will be a need for the rule of law, I'm paraphrasing, to be subjugated or subsumed under national interest. He said that to a conference of lawyers. That got me really worried because that, to me, was the tone from the top, the tone from the very top. And, um, and lawyers expressed, lawyers took umbrage, serious umbrage at those remarks by Mr. President. Uh, uh, at that conference, and, um, I, 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 and, and you know, they say the, the, um, um, the morning tells the day. So ever since the president makes, uh, made that comment or made that statement, we have watched as lawyers, watch his administration keenly. And, um, you know, when, even when it would have been, it, it might have been charitable on our part to give this government the benefit of the doubt, when you consider that he, he made that statement to a body of lawyers, uh, one is always on the lookout and we're always very, very careful to, um, and we scrutinize uh, the actions of this government. I think there's a lot more they can do better. They can do so much better in the way that um, they handle the issue of rule of law. Uh, I think um, they would need to pay more, uh, more respect to that issue. And um, the president will have to do more to convince us lawyers, us Nigerians, that um, his statement uh, at that particular occasion may just have been uh, uh, something said in error. Well, he has repeated it even after that <laughs> forum, and the Attorney General has also repeated the President's remarks. So uh, I doubt as many Nigerians would think there was just something said in an error. But let me ask you how worried you are uh, about the administration's constant scathing remarks of the judiciary being the weakest link as well when it comes to the fight against corruption in the country? Well, you know, um, well, I have scathing remarks for the judiciary myself. Um, so I'm not just going to rush off and say that um, um, those scathing remarks may have been unnecessary or misplaced. But then again, I noticed that um, the, the, um, this, particular administration, um, this particular administration is quite critical, or should I, I'm, I'm trying to pick my words, this particular association is not, uh, I don't think there's enough of uh, respect given to the judiciary. But then again, you remember to whom much is given, much is expected. Uh, I think the judiciary on its own part would need to be up and doing um, for it to earn the respect that it duly deserves. We must, um, we, I, I, I honestly am confounded by the fact that our judiciary is um, not independent and um, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of financial autonomy, uh, well, that's what I mean, because that for me is also very critical and at the heart of the problem, because um, he who pays the piper, as they say, if the purse strings are controlled essentially by one arm of government, um, it, um, uh, there, will, there, will be, there will be, I think, a condescension and denigration now and again by the benefactor to the beneficiary. So I, I think it's important that um, more is done to, to extricate the judiciary from, from uh, this um, unwholesome situation. Having said that, I think there's a lot of housekeeping that needs to be done at the level of the judiciary. Appointment of judges, uh, discipline of judges and justices, uh, and so on and so forth, training of, of, of judges and justices. 
because all of this is very important if indeed that arm of government is to be respected. Even commercial sensitive, uh, sensitivity. Our judges, a lot of them, are not really um, sensitive to the issues of commerce. And you get rulings and judgments that show that they really don't understand the role that uh, the judiciary uh, plays in terms of ensuring that commerce proceeds un unimpeded. Right. So, so that's my view. All right, Mr. Pata, you've spoken that you've actually given a superb verdict on the judiciary. Just before you go, turning back to the Nigeria Bar Association, what should we be expecting from the association, or how is the association rather handling COVID-19? We're in the COVID-19 pandemic era. How is the association handling it? How are they sensitizing the members? How are they going about the whole COVID-19 and their reactions to it generally? Briefly. Thank you. Uh, COVID-19, for those of us who are commercial practitioners, uh, I, I'm a corporate uh, commercial uh, lawyer, not non-court-going non attorney. And this is, COVID-19 only just helped to bring to the fore uh, many of the things that we have been trying to, uh, messages we have been trying to pass on to this profession, that there's a whole lot we need to do in terms of uh, the practice of law, um, the infusion of technology into our practices, and the need for us to embrace technology because that is where the world is going. In some respects, that is where the world is. For us to be globally competitive, we will need to embrace technology. We did not need a COVID to tell us that. But unfortunately, um, that has been the situation. And we are talking to our members at the level of uh, the section of business law of the MBA, at the level of the MBA itself, the national body. We're reaching out to our members and... Um, well, um, you know, even though this is a little too late, but it's never too late. So we, we, we are trying to make sure that we get our members to adapt to the new realities, to the new normal. And um, as you know, virtual court hearings are being contemplated. So um, our lawyers are trying to um, catch up okay. with technology. And also, um, uh, for the, everybody, Zooming has now become part of our lexicon. Indeed. So anybody who did not have an email address before right. would have to deal with that. So yeah, Mr. that's what we're doing. Mr. Lumide Akpata, thank you so much. We wish you all the best in your elections. And should you win, uh, we'll see you on the other side as the president of the Nigerian Bar Association. Best of luck. Thank you very much. Thank you.